We've already discussed virtual machine operating system guests, but what is a container? Let's talk about some container basics. A container really is an isolated application runtime environment where the operating system and some or all binary libraries required by the application are shared by containers. That means they're part of the underlying host operating system. However, there are some cases where you might bake some of these binary libraries into your application container if it requires very specific versions. So pictured in our diagram, we've got the host operating system at the bottom of the stack on which we would have installed the Docker engine. Now the Docker engine consists of the Docker server daemon, or in the case of Windows, it's just the Docker service, and the command line interface where we issue commands to create and manage containers. Now above that in the diagram, we see binaries and libraries, which are required by our application containers. So each application container then is isolated from the other, and you can run multiple containers running different applications all on the same host simultaneously. Now a container is based on an image and it's very important to understand the distinction between an image and a container because not only does the literature refer to them differently but they are different entities in the containerization and application isolation environment and they also have their own different command sets. So an image in Docker contains software and settings for running a container. Now it only becomes a container when you actually run the image. So as we can see here, a container then you could say is a runtime instance of an image. And the image will also potentially contain metadata that describes the image. That would be things like tags, maybe to associate it with a department or to give it a meaningful name. So we might have a basic Windows Server core image. And then from there, we could start up a container router where we could actually maybe even configure it further and build an image from that. Now within the container, you're going to have the elements that are needed to run an app. So the software itself, its settings, in some cases you might have the app specific libraries right in the image, which becomes a container when it's running. You will have a fully functional runtime environment depending on the specifics of your application and potentially some tools. So containers then are application sandboxing solutions. They're not specifically tied to the host and you can move containers between Docker hosts, but you have to be careful with that because the operating system version on the Docker host would have to be the same. And depending on requirements for specific versions of application libraries, you have to be careful. You might have to make sure those are installed and updates are applied. Now, interestingly, on the topic of moving containers between Docker hosts, you can actually run Linux containers on Windows using what are called Hyper-V containers, which we'll talk about in more detail later. You can also use a reference image that could be used to deploy many containers. And remember, a container is just a running version of an image. So for example, let's say we've got a golden reference image that we use for developers and it's already got the right version of Python that we want to use to develop, installed, and configure with the appropriate tools. So that way, when we get a new Python developer on staff, we just have to essentially start up a container from that image and they're ready to go. Now, container startup time, this is not a virtual machine, it's a container. So starting up a container is very quick since the underlying operating system kernel is already running. The operating system kernel is not contained within the container. Now we're going to talk about the distinction later about Windows Server versus Hyper-V containers, but generally the container does not have the OS. So the container is an isolated OS kernel running process. What that really means is that within the host operating system, we can see that there is a container running. It's actually listed as a running background process. Now, all of our application specific elements, of, as we've discussed, are stored within the container. But we've also mentioned that in some cases, specific versions of binary libraries might be required and you might have them baked directly into your container in that case. Containers support data persistence. That simply means that if your application writes something, then that will persist until you actually delete that container. Containers are also scalable to address peak application requests. 
Now we'll talk about Docker Swarm and how to manage and orchestrate the configuration and the management of a cluster for Docker high availability and performance availability. But when we think about container scalability, we should try to make sure that we don't run multiple services within a single container. Now, again, that really depends on the specific of your app, but we like to kind of keep things modular. And if we have to break up an app into two or more containers, that's absolutely possible because we can configure inter-network communication between containers, even across a cluster. Containers are very efficient in terms of versioning. What this means is that only incremental changes are uploaded and downloaded when we start working with the images on which the container is based. In the Windows environment, we have two container runtime choices, Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers. We'll deal with this a little bit more in detail later, but for now, Windows Server containers means that we've got the host operating system kernel that is shared among containers. So the OS is not the apps within the container. This also means that the host computer can see the running process or container when it's running. Now, Hyper-V containers, on the other hand, are actually a lightweight virtual machine that does contain a lightweight version of an operating system. So therefore, there's a separate kernel for each container. And the process is unknown to the host computer because all it sees is a virtual machine that's running. And actually, this is how Windows 10 can support running Docker containers. Because of the ease in which containers can be deployed, kind of like virtual machines, over time you need to be careful you don't end up with container sprawl. That means having a bunch of containers that are running which aren't needed, which is a waste of resources at many levels because it means that's less more needed containers we might be able to run on a host, takes up storage space and so on. So over time, we might consider going through and removing unused containers. We haven't yet worked with the Docker command line interface, but we'll be getting into that starting now. For example, Docker space RM is for Docker remove, and we can give it, for example, the container ID. So when you launch a container, it gets a unique ID assigned, and we can specify that to remove an unused container. Same with images, except the command is different, of course. We would use Docker space RMI for a remove image and then give it the ID of that image.